Virtue signaling is the action or practice of publicly expressing opinions or sentiments intended to demonstrate one's good character or the moral correctness of one's position on a particular issue. And I would contrast that to actions aimed at actually solving problems in the real world. And there's been a lot of virtue signaling in the last couple of weeks, this is why I'm thinking about this, is for example, you see all these memes on Facebook about how if you see a Nazi punch them and all this discussion of how great it is to punch Nazis. And I mean, the question that I kept thinking about and kept asking is, how does it actually affect change in the real world to punch a buffoon? Because that's what Nazis are in the United States. You know, I wrote an entire book about this, The Cultural Make-Believe, about how, you know, when we think of racism, we think of white robe buffoons chanting white power in sort of mush mouth Southern voices. But that's not, that's not where the real action is. And it's like, my friend uh, and mentor, John Keeble, wrote when he was studying white supremacist groups in the 90s that we love to hate white supremacist groups because they are just an extreme example of the hatred and fear that characterizes society. And I'm not saying that they're attitudes are not deplorable, I'm saying that they're easy and that simply, um, well, I'm gonna go a different direction for a second. And back in the 1990s, um, someone asked Michael Moore who the Michigan militia was. And he said, it's the unemployed arm of the UAW. And he was making, I thought, a very sophisticated point about how the militias were and are a predictable response to collapsing capitalism and a collapsing middle class. And more recently, he was on, just the last couple of weeks, he was on... Um, I believe it was Rachel Maddow, but it might have been some other show on MSNBC. And his analysis had moved strictly toward virtue signaling, where he said that there, uh, he was saying that the message of these uh, neo Nazis is so vile that he wouldn't repeat it on the show. And that is just a remarkable difference between a functional analysis and simply showing how virtuous he is. And whenever I think about hate groups and supremacist groups, I think of a conversation I had, an interview I did with Joel Dyer back in the 1990s. And Joel Dyer had written a book called Harvest of Rage, which was how so many, it was about the farm crisis and how so many of the farmers were ending up in these racist, militant, horrible organizations. And he said that when, I mean, the, 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 the heart and soul of his analysis was that if you're desperate and if you're losing your farm and your, your family's gone, this farm's been in your family for three generations, uh, you're losing it to the bank and you're sitting there at your kitchen table with a shotgun in your lap and an empty bottle of Jack Daniels on the floor, wondering whether to put the shotgun in your mouth. And somebody knocks on your door and says, hey brother, I feel your pain, let's talk. Tell me about what's going on. He said, if that person is a Mormon, you're gonna become a Mormon. If that person is a Jehovah's Witness, you'll become a Jehovah's Witness. If that person is an anti-capitalist left-wing activist, you'll become an anti-capitalist left-wing activist. If that person is a white supremacist, you will become a white supremacist. And it is no surprise that a lot of these um, white supremacists that have been in the news so much recently, a lot of them are from 
the Rust Belt, because the Rust Belt has been absolutely devastated economically by NAFTA, by international trade in general, by the slow collapse of empire. In the culture make-believe, the culture make-believe was supposed to be a five-page introduction to an encyclopedia of hate groups. And I asked, what is a hate group? And I went to, and that, that was the mistake that opened up the whole book, because I went to a KKK website and the KKK said, well, we're not a hate group, we're a love group because we love whites. And so I was left with a choice, either I can, either the KKK is not a hate group or you can't always trust rhetoric. I mean, I saw, I saw one uh, meme going around Facebook about how, you know, if you see a Nazi punch them, and I made the point, and some other people made the point, well, what we have been called Nazis for not believing that women should be forced to share their spaces with men. I mean, how do you define a Nazi? And the guy responded, well, if they call themselves a Nazi, they are. And I was like, oh, okay, so the only Nazis you can punch are the stupid ones? The ones who are stupid enough to actually call themselves Nazis? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You know, if you go by the, just the numbers, the biggest racist segregationist organization in the United States is the U.S. judicial and penal system because it's achieved segregation of African-American males on a scale the KKK can only dream of. So I started asking, how does, what are the various ways that the hatred of this culture, that hatred in this culture manifests itself? And one of the things I came to is that any hatred felt long enough no longer feels like hatred. It feels like economics. It feels like pornography. It feels like the judicial system. It feels like the way things are. And that's part of the problem is that capitalism and the entire system, the entire supremacist system by definition, pits one against another. And so as long as things are going fine, and as long as you are allowed to seamlessly exploit all of those beneath you, then things are going okay for those in the middle and up because you always have all those below you, you can exploit. But when the economy starts to falter, the competition becomes more fierce and the hatred that was underneath comes raging out. And a great example of this I learned was from the very good book, How the Irish Became White by Noel Ignatieff. And in that book, he talks about how when the Irish came to the United States in the 19th century, early 19th century, many of them were fleeing terrible conditions. And when they got here, they really, as a society, as a group, as a culture, had a choice. They could either ally themselves with others of the working class, including the freed African Americans, or they could attempt to, as Ignatia put it, become white. They could attempt to join the upper classes. And the choice as a whole, as a collective, was to join the upper, try to join the upper classes as unsuccessful as that may have been. And I was thinking about that when, when I was reading his book and then when I was writing Culture Make Believe and I was thinking about how, okay, pretend I'm an Irish man and I had six children when I left Ireland and they came over on the boat, two of them died on the boat and I get to Ireland or I get to the United States and I still have four children and I'm married and I have a wife and she, I am trying to get a job because my two youngest children are starving to death. And it ends up that there is an African American who will work for slightly less than I will. Now I can try to have working class solidarity or I can try to use any advantage I can in this culture to get a job because my children are dying. And so fuck working class solidarity, fuck the black guy, fuck race relations, fuck anything except getting me some food, getting me a job. And this is capitalism. This is not me speaking. This is capitalism speaking through these people and how they become 
how it creates racism. And, and then once my child is no longer in danger of starving, well, I can buy into the system and baby needs new shoes. And then after that, baby needs a college education. And then we need a nice house and we need a car. And so once you bought into the system, it's not simply life and death anymore, but the rewards of the system make it seem like it is. And my point in all this is that when you have, it is no surprise that the collapsing German economy led to the rise of the Nazi state. And it is no surprise that the KKK would do well in the United States during times of economic troubles. Because when there are economic troubles, people look for scapegoats. And because we are always so identified with the oppressor and we must protect the oppressor at all times, most of us cannot look at the real source of our misery, which is capitalism itself. Instead, we scratch and claw at those around us. So a white middle class or white, white lower middle class person who used to be middle class and is now lower middle class and is on the verge of homelessness can easily and wrongly rationalize that his problems are because of those women in the workforce or because of those damn Mexicans from across the border or because of those damn black people. And this is all a misdirection and it is all the source of the problems are the system itself and the, the system itself that pits us one against the other. And I think another part of the problem is that and I see this in simple living activists and I see this in virtue signaling, both of which they're, they're closely related. And I love the line by Eric Fromm, I affect therefore I am. And when we are facing this huge system that is dreadfully destructive, and when we are seeing historical forces and we are seeing the end of empire and empire is ending, when we're seeing what's playing out with peak oil, that the economy is undergoing what may seem to us on a day-to-day -day scale, a slow collapse, but is in actuality a pretty fast collapse because a collapse is not like the walls of Jericho falling with trumpets blaring and people looking up and seeing a wall collapse on them. The collapse of an economy is a business going out of business and another one not replacing it. It's going through towns and seeing empty business. It's, it's increasing centralization of wealth. It's, it's what we see around us. And I'm not excusing the attitudes of the white supremacists or the hard right. I'm not excusing them at all. I'm attempting to understand them because we on the left have, to go back to the Joel Dyer comments, we on the left have done a terrible job. Instead of making our systematic analysis clear, we have virtue signaled and we have claimed how morally superior we are. And that's not particularly helpful. And one of the reasons this has to happen functionally is because the left wing is because a lot of us on the left don't understand that the Democrats and the Republicans, we don't fully understand that they are good cop, bad cop, and that they're two sides of the same coin. And so you get the so-called leftist press, MSNBC, et cetera, cannot talk about the problems being inherently capitalism because they have to serve their democratic masters. And so all they can do is virtue signal. I mean, I see this, honestly, I see this in, in for example, the black bloc that a lot of the insurrectionary anarchists oppose Organize it. Well, I'm going to back up again. And I was having a really interesting discussion the other day with Ramsey Kanan, a wonderful anarchist publisher, 
and organizer, and he was talking about there's a difference between mobilization and organization. And he said, you can, you can mobilize on Facebook. You can mobilize like the Arab Spring got mobilized really quickly, but there's a huge difference between or mobilizing and organizing. The mobilizing doesn't actually, we can mobilize a million people for a march, but if you're not organizing for long-term struggle, that didn't actually do any good. So we can mobilize a bunch of people to go punch Nazis in the face, and that's great. But how is that going to affect the sy systemic problems? In order to do that, you have to organize. And that's an entirely different situation. And this is a problem I have with, with some of the actions of the Black Bloc, for example, is that a lot of them are insurrectionary anarchists who, who have a disdain for organizing. They can be very good at mobilizing and getting people out, but there is no larger scale organization. The plan is let's go punch a Nazi in the face. Let's go raise some, raise some ruckus. And that is certainly useful at raising ruckus. But the question I always ask is what does it accomplish in the longer term? If you aren't going to change the material conditions of society, then what you're left with is I can change myself and I can no longer use toilet paper. I can live really simply. I can back away. And I can also go on Facebook and I can say how much I hate Nazis. But if you really want to change things, what you need to do is change the material conditions of society such that it no longer creates Nazis. That's what we need to do, is examine the roots of it and examine how capitalism systematically and functionally requires them, how white supremacism requires the sort of white robe buffoons and also requires a racist judicial system. And that's actually what I'm much more interested in doing is changing those foundations of society. And here's one more thing I wanna say is that in cultural make-believe I was asking why it was that there were so many more lynchings after the Civil War than before. And I was, I was going along with it, not, not really getting anywhere until I read this great line by Nietzsche, which is, one does not hate when one can despise. And despise comes from the root despicere, which means to look down on, the same root as spectacles. Um, despicere means to look down upon. And so you despise someone who is below you on the hierarchy. And as long as you can despise them, as long as, as a white person, you can have access, unfettered access to the lives and labor of the black people, then everything is fine from your perspective. But if that entitlement to exploit is threatened, then the hatred that underlay this contempt all along comes raging out. And so you see just a huge rise of lynchings post-American Civil War because no longer was that system of exploitation in place. We see the same thing in domestic violence situations that as long as the wife gives the sex, as long as the wife makes sure the dinner's on the table, as long as she provides the resources to the superior male, everything is fine from his perspective. But when it's not, or when he has an excuse for it not to be, then the underlying hatred comes raging out. And we know that a woman who leaves a batterer is about, I believe it's seven or nine times more likely to be killed in the time when she's leaving because she's threatening that perceived entitlement to exploit. And I wish that we in this culture, in this time of collapsing empire, would recognize this and plan for it and recognize that white robed buffoons and all of the forms of racism that we see around us are completely predictable 
aspects of a collapsing empire. And we would respond to them with more intelligence and utility than simply punching the buffoon in the face. What I want is for us to, A, create a revolutionary mindset that understands and conveys the ways that capitalism, patriarchy, and supremacism set us against each other and responds intelligently to that. And I would also want for us to recognize at the same time, I'm, when I'm saying this, I'm not saying this means, oh, we need to just have compassion for the, the Nazis. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we need to recognize the functional aspects of it. And at the same time, we need to recognize that this is what happens historically again and again. And we need to prepare ourselves for that too such that this is one reason I argue all the time that we need to make our allegiance to women absolute now, because as mills close, it's predictable. Rates of domestic violence go up. And as an entire economy shuts down, we know what happens when patriarchal civic society collapses. Rates of rape go through the roof. And What we need to do is to prepare for that collapse and respond more intelligently to it than simply punching the person nearest to us. And we need to find ways to make our allegiance to women absolute. And we need to find ways to make our allegiance to other oppressed groups absolute as well, by which of course I'm including the natural world. One of the reasons I feel that a functional analysis is so important is not because I believe that if you understand how something is happening and understand the social forces behind it, that this means that you can necessarily prevent it. But what it does mean is that you can you are more likely to be able to respond appropriately when it does happen. And you can ameliorate it or you can affect the direction of it. Understanding, understanding how and why something happens is the first step, I think, toward responding appropriately to it.